Good morning, everybody. Welcome in. Uh, joining us. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning. This is Darius Dell here, senior analyst on the Hedge Eye Macro team. I'm joined in the studio today with Hedge Eye CEO Keith McCullough. We'd like to uh, welcome you guys to this free edition of the Hedge Eye Macro Show uh, for Wednesday, January 2020. Um, if you have any questions, just pop into the chat stream. Uh, we'll try to get to as many as we can, starting with the most popular ones at first. With that, take away, Keith. Thank you, Darius. It's not always free, but again, we're trying to get you uh, watching what matters. What Again, what they will say matters this morning. Uh, their top three things will be Carlos, Trump, and World War III? I don't know. I mean, uh, let's just go with the top three things that are actually moving in macro. That's what we do every single morning. Again, the top three things in my notebook, it starts at 4.30. If you don't watch my tweets, you can audit those as well. Uh, then it's followed by the top three callouts in the macro data, uh, which will show you quite, uh, quite, quite convincingly as well every single day. Uh, Asia number one this morning, then the Russell, then we'll hit on the VIX. But first on Asia, uh, again, continuing signals out of Japan. So again, Japan is an important, obviously, macro signal, certainly was on the way up and certainly is in terms of the global equity rally or the performance chasing that we saw in December. So in Japan, if you look at the chart here, you can see all of the December gains are gone, okay? Uh, so whatever people thought uh, could, should, or would happen from a, a global economic bottom perspective in December was bullshit, and it didn't bottom. So again, if you bought anything in Japan up in there, uh, you lost money. Moreover, you bought it at the third time that it made uh, that same high. So again, uh, back to when the world was actually in globally synchronized recovery peaking process uh, back at Q118. And by the way, we were you know, to, the, to the wall long of growth and everything else back then. Uh, that's what it was. So again, this is an important signal. Of course, uh, immediate term trade oversold is Japan, uh, but that's important. It broke immediate term trade support and so did the Kospi. Uh, the Kospi many times. Uh, and again, this is different. And again, uh, it's not always an A-B test that works. It's different than our current uh, GIP model. So we're looking for uh, South Korea to come out of the, uh, the, bad, uh, the bad quadrants and into the good ones. Uh, but again, the market signal says stay away for now. So again, uh, that's been a good call for a long time and I'm in no rush to buy it. I'll buy it when I damn well please, which is at the low end of the risk range first. And again, you'd look for confirming bullish trend or a phase transition in South Korean equities, which I currently don't have on that signal. So that's important in as much as anything else in Asia. Uh, what else I got for you this morning? Number two, the Russell. It's down for the year to date. Year to date, year to date. Remember how all these people talking about year to date, year to date? How about the cycle to date, or today to date, or yesterday to date? Yesterday to date, the Russell was down. Uh, for the year to date, it's down. Uh, for the cycle to date, it's down. It's down 4.7% versus where we got you out of small caps, uh, again, at the end of the third quarter of 2018. Don't forget, you sell small caps when you're in quad three or quad four. When we hit quad four in Q4 of 18, small caps crashed. Uh, some people may forget that, and then they talk about the year to date return off that crashed out low, uh, which again, uh, of course they sold it all at the top and bought it at the bottom. Uh, but again, I digress. That's just people on TV uh, where you can get that for free uh, daily. Uh, but again, if you just look at it for what it is, uh, small caps only work when you're in quad one and two. And most specifically, we're long small caps when they were in quad one and two, uh, particularly coming out of 2016 and throughout 2017 and up until Q3 of 2018. So that's important. Uh, the Russell shorted on rallies to the top end of the risk range that is published in our daily risk range product as are most things that are big in macro. Okay, point number three this morning, uh, VIX. Okay, so instead of calling for World War III uh, or for Carlos or for whatever, I have no idea why you watch that. I don't, uh, it's a waste of your time. Uh, your time in life is precious, uh, spend it accordingly. So again, if you look at what it looks at like, the vol of vol, the volatility of volatility, if you don't know what that is, you're gonna learn something here. That is the leading indicator for the surface area of price or the moving monkeys that make people agitate up and down. Macro tourism fully loaded. The vol of vol, the volatility of volatility said, no, I'm not concerned about World War III. Okay, so we have more longs this morning than we do shorts, and we should, so, because again, unless volatility can break out on a trending basis, or the vol of vol rises in US equities, why would you short them? Instead, you buy the top four sector exposures in quad three, which again, are tech, uh, tech, utilities, REITs, and energy stocks, okay? Uh, not in that order, but again, those are the top four sector overweight. So that's what we want you to do. We don't want to be buying stocks or selling bonds or whatever. We want to buy what works in the economic quadrant, quad three, you want to be long. In addition to that, you want to be long commodities. I already said the energy stocks is a good way to play that. Russian stocks. There are plenty of things to be long in quad three against your short dollar position, short transports, short industrials, lots to do, all right? Those are your 
top three things. Low end of the risk range, by the way, in the VIX is still a higher low, though, so be careful at 1201. Uh, what we do next after I go through the top three things, and uh, apologies in advance for paying subscribers for taking a little bit of uh, extra time there, uh, what we do next is we go through uh, the ranges that matter and what you should be doing uh, in and around those ranges. Simple, just to simplify, because we want to, again, simplify the complex. You sell the top end of the range, you buy and cover at the low end of the range. That's what we want to do, uh, again, across anything, uh, anything that ticks. S&P 500 risk range uh, for today, uh, low end of the risk range is 3190. Again, according to who? According to me and the math, okay? Uh, it's math, it's not a feeling. I didn't feel anything when futures were down 40 handles on the Iranian attack. Zero, you should feel nothing. In fact, you should have bought futures there because we're pretty close to the low end of the range. Uh, so again, that's what you do. You buy, and if you're short, then you cover. Shouldn't be short, because uh, S&P 500 is currently bullish trend. Okay, top end of the risk range is currently 32.57. And if you want to short the S&P 500 at the all-time high, which is incidentally 32.57 and the top end of the range, then go do that, all right? You can use the process however suits you. Again, this is designed to empower you with math, lots of data, and a good, good timely uh, opportunities to make good decisions in your portfolio. Uh, or if you're just a day trader, then do it that. Do whatever you need to do, just don't watch TV and do what they do, okay? We need them to be gainfully employed, and I, and I absolutely mean that with all the sincerity in the world. If we don't have them, we can't make money. So don't be angry about it, right? Make money, okay? Uh, low end of the risk range, by the way, is 1.5% uh, downside versus yesterday's close and plus 0.6% on the upside. So even though the futures have bounced and some people will be like apoplectic about this, oh my God, I can't believe this has happened. They bounced because they sold off so hard, right? Because a bunch of monkeys sold them at the lows. Now they got to cover at the highs or they get fired. Okay, so that's a pretty straightforward uh, behavioral realities. But if all you do, again, just sell at the top end of the range, buy at the low end of the range. You could have done that with crude oil yesterday. Actually, we've had two big days uh, of oil signaling a media term trade overbought, right around 64, which is the top end of the range, or energy stocks, they signaled overbought, which is one of our favorite sectors right now, and used to be one of the favorite sectors on the short side. So again, this is how you use the process. Please use the math to empower you, to again, remove the emotion, the politics, all your biases. You have many, I have many too, okay? It's taken me 20 years to try to remove that, and again, just be dispassionate and selfish, and again, make good decisions within the risk range, okay? Selfishly, you wanna make money doing the most uh, of that that you can. Uh, what else do I got going on for you this morning? Oh, the VIX risk range is 1201 uh, to 1595. So again, we wanna be looking at this, obviously within the lens of this. So we wanna be looking at that within the lens of that. So the VIX currently is saying buy stocks. Yeah, not every stock, buy the stocks that you like, which, by the way, in the risk range product, uh, Google's been one of my favorites, personally, because we don't have an analyst that follows it, so I can selfishly buy it at the low end of the range, which we did, or I did, uh, again, last week. Again, that happened, then boom, you could sell some today, because it's at the top end of the range. So Google's in there, that's a bullish trend. The beloved Apple currently is bullish trend. Sometimes it's bearish trend. Sometimes uh, Bitcoin's bullish trend. Uh, it's currently bearish trend. Uh, but again, that's what, and, and Bitcoin's in there as well. That's what you can do. You know, you can do that. It's much better than listening to some monkey on TV. Okay, what else we got going on? Uh, for you this morning. And again, I don't apologize. I, I, I love monkeys. I, they're, they're fantastic. We, um, we had a presentation at our company meeting on monkeys, uh, the behavioral fact. We, we understand monkeys. We love monkeys. Uh, like I said, we want to keep monkeys gainfully employed. It's awesome. Okay. Uh, sectors. What else we got going on for you this morning? Uh, actually, look at the volume first and then do that. Then Josephine will flip it around. She's on the switch this morning. Uh, again, I don't have a teleprompter. I have data. Uh, okay. So yesterday's volume was down 14% versus the prior day. Again, if you don't build um, your risk range using price, volume, and volatility, and you just run around with your hair on fire saying, oh, volume doesn't matter because some guy told me it. No, it matters. Okay. It matters every single day. The relationship between price, volume, and volatility absolutely matters. Uh, since we just redid our deck, Darius, I don't know what slide that is, uh, but again, it's within the lens of our trade trend tail model. And we also look at implied volatility premiums and discounts. Uh, so what you actually had happen, if you look at that uh, yesterday uh, at the close, because again, people have been getting a little bit nervous about uh, World War III or something like that. Carlos not getting out. I, don't, I have no idea why they're talking about these things. Uh, but again, like I care, is, is Carlos going to affect anything that I do today? No, no, absolutely not, right? So again, what we're looking at, look at implied vol. Most of you actually that are watching this for free have no idea what I'm talking about, which is an entirely eye-opening thing, wouldn't it be? Just to look at that data in and of itself is probably alarming. Isn't it easier just to listen to an unreformed broker talk about why you should buy like uh, Slack? I, I mean, I don't know, maybe, that, maybe that's why you watch that. Uh, but again, the implied volatility premium yesterday in SPY was 49%. 
So what that means is that people have already bought protection, okay? Um, so you don't want to buy protection when everybody's you bought protection. What you want to do is buy protection when everybody is absolutely capitulated on their shorts and is super complacent about their longs. That's definitely when you have an implied volatility discount on something. So again, versus 30 day realize, I digress. What else I got going on for you this morning? Sectors, let's go back to that switch. Yesterday, that's why you have an implied volatility premium because every sector other than comms were down. Okay, uh, so again, it was not a good day to be long broadly of stocks. Uh, basic materials is a certified train wreck. Uh, obviously, if you look at our model, quad three is where you're short materials, so congratulations on that. Uh, so there's a lot to do. The days of just buying stocks, because uh, you know, because people just like, it's old wall. You know, that, that, that ended like, I don't know, when Moneyball was printed in 2003? Like, it's over. Yeah, what else we got going on for you this morning? I got Asia, obviously recap, Japan, Kospi, China, all this stuff, by the way, is in the notebook. Please don't listen to anybody unless they, they talk in numbers, i.e. they're measuring and mapping things on a daily basis. And that's just me, again, from a market signaling perspective, and I do the entire world across asset classes, anything that ticks that's major, uh, and actually stuff that's not so major, uh, Russia, Russia's stock market, for example. And then you look at Darius's big, big daily dump. I mean, this morning, his first tweet came right out there at 4.30 in the morning, if you're paying attention. Uh, there it is, that's what he's doing. There are no words. I mean, they're the titles of the things no, that are ticking, words, but those look like numbers to me and they're color coded in rates of change. So again, when you take your big daily dump, data dump, get your head out of that gutter, uh, you look at it for what it is. It was, again, some good, some bad. Green's good, red's bad. Uh, so again, that's what it is. And the rate of change it is, okay? So if I look at the rate of change of something, uh, for example, uh, Taiwan had a positive rate of change in exports yesterday. For those of you that pay, pay for the content, you can see that. Is that yesterday's daily dump? Taiwan. Wow, she's doing that too. Okay, so look, South. the rate of change accelerated. So again, when the rate of change of a number, for those of you that are not familiar with this, uh, if you drive a car, when your car accelerates, okay, that's, that's what it's doing, okay? When you hit the brakes, it slows down. So you're either accelerating or decelerating. So that view of the economic data is not an opinion. It's a fact, all right? There's no like opinion about val you know, no, valuations opinion. A forward outlook on earnings is an opinion. Somebody's narrative on what makes a stock great, that's an opinion. The rate of changes are facts, okay? We deal in facts. We color it up with cartoons. Uh, if I was on mute, maybe I'd be uh, more appealing to some of you, maybe to others not, okay? I don't particularly care, as you can probably tell. I don't care what other people think about me. All I care about is selfishly making as much money as I possibly can and helping to make you mu uh, as much money as you can. And most importantly, making sure we don't lose money when they do, okay? That's the most important thing about the process uh, in and of itself. All right, what, what else I got going on? India corrected a little bit. That's a market that we do like. Uh, Taiwan, uh, Taiwan down uh, a half a percent. That's another market that we like on the equity side. There's always something to do. The ETF for Taiwan, if you didn't know, is EWT, and, in, and on India, it's INDA. Uh, the CAC, the Italian stock market, the Spanish stock market, all down, but not down a lot. You know, what the markets were telling you this morning, even in Israel, so that's something that I tweeted this morning, and you should absolutely be paying attention. I'm just like not randomly tweeting shit to, to, you know, for kicks and giggles. Uh, if you want to watch that, watch Downtown, or whatever his name is, Brown. Uh, but the, the reality is that, that Israel was down like 20 basis points this morning. Does that signal to you that the locals feel that they're going to hit by World War III this morning? No. And that's not what happened this morning. So again, there are a lot of different indicators that have nothing to do with Carlos Ghosn that can help you understand why the futures are rallying. So again, if they were going down on the risk for World War III or some version of that, obviously that's not that. And there are plenty of places that you can find that. Oil's another place. So if you look at that this morning, uh, oil, for example, uh, tap the top end of the range. So you should have been making sales anyway. Even if it was World War III, I still would have made sales, okay? Now, there would be an entirely different risk management exercise if we were in the middle of World War III. I'm not trying to discount that that could happen, by the way. I'm not trying to be, you know, clever, or again, trying to, you know, to be disrespectful of those risks. They can be there. But again, the market uh, has a not so funny way of punishing you for, for believing in the end of the world every day, okay? Uh, so again, top end of the risk range. Again, you can write it down in your notebook every day, 63.94 for WTI, 60.38 is the loan of the range. So if you haven't bought oil, we've been buying oil and energy stocks going back since the beginning of October after being short them prior to that for uh, a year. Uh, that's, that's what you do. That's your next best stop. The next best thing that you can do is buy energy XLE at the loan of the range, which is published in your daily risk range product today, and buy oil at $60 and 38 cents. Otherwise, you're just being a bad boy or a bad girl because you're chasing. Yep, you're chasing. You're just chasing. You're just chasing charts. Said by any, uh, said by any chart monkey anywhere, uh, never. 
at the at the turn in inflation and growth, do they not do they see that coming in the chart? Okay, uh, so that's important. Obviously, all the charts for energy stocks and oil look bad at the beginning of October, and that's when we bought it. It has it is charts. I mean, it, charts. I guess they matter after after they move. Uh, what else do we got going on for you this morning? Here's a chart. Look at the Russia chart. That's a pretty good looking chart. It's a great chart. I think everybody likes that chart now. Uh, mm -hmm. But but did you buy Russia when you should have bought Russia in October? early October, throughout September, on the decline, at, uh, at every higher low. That's what you should be doing. Understanding that Russia, unlike China and the US, was in the right quadrant. So again, four quadrant model, you guys can pop that up there, slide uh, six, at least it was in the former deck. Now we got the new deck, current uh, macro themes deck. Yeah. See that? So the USA is in quad three. That's not what Russia is doing uh, currently. So that's important. If you want to look at slide 20, you can see the G20 countries, uh, any country. Okay, any country. This is a, a, an exercise in as much as rate of changes in awareness. Okay, so again, we can tell you what every single country in the G20 is doing, what quadrant they've been in, which is an economic fact, and prospectively which one we have them mapping towards. Okay, so you can see Russia go down the line, it's been in the right quad, whereas the USA, again, quad three is not the same quad as Russia's been in. Okay, so that's important, uh, as opposed to being uh, just, you know, buying anything that is stocks, you would buy Russian stock. Uh, slide 23, if you want to blow that out to where Russia actually fits, which is in our bullish view of EM, but again, selectively, this isn't your grandpappy's uh, EM. We're going to buy the EMs that are in quad one and two, not the ones that are in quad four. Are you crazy? Do you even know what quad four is? Oh, that's going to get you paid too. That's not free. Uh, these updates obviously uh, are ongoing and that's actually why we're going to get you a little hooked here, right? You got to get the, if you don't get up and you don't have the process, you're just kind of flailing around, right? Macro tourist. <laughs> <laughs> Listening to Gone. Yeah, Gone. That's what you got to, imagine that's what you had to do this morning. I just didn't know. <laughs> kind of like looking for some tips. I want to have somebody pitch me on their stock, give me a tip. and uh, Prison break. And maybe have Elon dancing. Like, I mean, I can imagine how you'd be frustrated with that. Uh, what else do we got going on for you this morning? Oh, gold. Oh, beautiful. It's beautiful. Chart didn't look good in November, but now it looks awesome. I mean, so again, risk range in gold is published daily. We still like that. That's another way to play real interest rates. Falling low into the risk range for gold is uh, 1507. That's the best you can do if you haven't bought it yet. And 1591 is the top end of the range. Uh, copper uh, has moved to bullish trends. So broadly, commodities were bullish on that. Uh, so it's not a huge conceptual surprise that the things that uh, are required to make copper are inflating, and so is the price of copper. Okay, so again, uh, that is what it is. And again, we want to delineate and differentiate between being long inflation and the bottom in demand, okay? You can see a big industrial company this morning pre-announcing on that front, and Granger's gonna have a tough day in, in due course. Because again, these companies have to report reality, okay? That's another big important part that we're gonna go through as we dance throughout um, uh, the quarter. Lennar actually today, it's another good example of a sector that we've been long since everybody puked on it uh, at the end of the third quarter of 2018 when they thought interest rates were gonna go to 4% on the 10-year. We said poo-poo on that. We bought ourselves some housing, okay? So housing now has great economic data 15 months in, Lennar reiterates that this morning, so you book some gains in housing. Lower highs in housing. Housing's nowhere near uh, the bullish setup that it was back then. It's still bullish trend, but making lower highs, and we would sell some at the top end of the range if we have any questions on that. Ten-year yield risk range, we write that down daily. So again, 176. You'll learn something here, too. 176, low end of the range, top end of the range, 187. Okay? Could be 191 intraday. The thing about these data points is that they move as price, volume, and volatility moves intraday. So the 10-year this morning was at like 180, and then it's like, okay, all clear, buy, buy stocks, and it went to 183. Still, you do nothing there. What you want to do is you want to buy treasuries when the top end of the range and the yield is there, and you want to sell some bonds when you're at the low end of the range, okay? Bought a bond, sold a bond. Everybody knows how to do that unless they watch CNBC. What else do I got going on for you this morning? Uh, not, well, there, there are other things, but all is well. Uh, in the words of your favorite president of all time. <laughs> yeah, I like, oh. And uh, I don't know what you do with that, but uh, I don't know what you do with a lot of things that people talk about on, on mainstream TV every day, single day. Uh, so if you want to talk about things that matter, uh, please ask some questions. Awesome. Uh, yeah, just a reminder, just pop into the chat stream. Uh, the most popular ones we'll get to, and I'll try to get as many as we can this morning. We'll have a little extended show for it, for you guys. All right, Colin's got the most popular question with 32 upvotes this morning. Thank you, Colin. Uh, it's, it's knowing that we will use the risk ranges and other data as our guide. When, in all caps, will you start to use the process to start moving completely out of energy in preparation for Quad 4? Well, the process is, is singular. It's not what you just defined as the process, so I appreciate that you got a lot of upvotes, vote, upvotes for that, but you, should, you can get more votes if you asked it uh, more specifically and accurately. So again, the process is singular. So again, you have what quad are you in, and most importantly, going towards, 
and B, so that's A, it's an A-B test, and B, what is the market signal? So the market signal is really going to, and, and you appropriately called that out, uh, that's, that's when. You can go all caps or you can go little caps on that, that's when. I'm going to sell some, I don't even have to know. All I have to do is sell energy anytime it hits the top end of the range, de-risk the position, buy more at the low end of the range, until A, we start to get closer to the market saying, oh, I'm going to start to discount that we're going back into quad four. Indeed. Awesome. Uh, Ben's asking, uh, Keith mentioned the number 15 out of 30 ranked factors in the, for the GDP estimate yesterday. Can you share the top three? Uh, yeah, so number one, it's industrial production. That's on slide 31, I think, in the new deck, Josephine. Yeah. It's also in the process part of the deck, so if we, we now have... Um... Oh, yeah, you can actually just see it in the, in the table, obviously. Yep. Yeah. So this industrial production on 31, 34 is retail sales control group currently. And by the way, these are all dynamically reweighting. They change every quarter based on their, um, their marginal impact on, on projecting the, the accuracy of GDP. Um, and then um, number three is initial jobless claims, a year-over-year rate of change in that, which I believe is on slide 37. Yep, so okay, this, here's a good, good example. So on, within that data, the number, um, again, you wanna just talk about what matters. So again, let's go back to the car. Uh, I have to come up with new metaphors all the time just to keep myself going. But again, uh, the car's an easy one, okay? You're either accelerating or you're decelerating. You have 30 data points per month, 90 per quarter, and the, and the data points are ranked in terms of their marginal impact on the model. So yesterday, the number nine feature out of the, t out of the 30 got reported. It's called factory orders. So think about your car. Let's just think about that's your oil or maybe your tires, something that's critical, uh, not as critical as you and the wheel, uh, but critical. It's not the number one, but it's number nine. So the number nine gets reported. Number nine gets reported. This, by the way, hate to rain on your parades if you're thinking that the economic data is all is well. All right. The number nine data point comes in at minus 1.47% on a year over year basis. That's versus minus 1.2 something 7%. Let's just say it's pretty close. So this number in terms of deceleration is decelerating at a faster rate than the prior number. Why do I remember those numbers? And most people watching TV today are going to remember Carlos Ghosn. <laughs> Carlos Ghosn. <laughs> I can't believe it. That's what matters. Okay, this is what matters to the process. You know, and, and the only people that are critical of it are the people that, are t that have no idea, right? It's easy to be critical of something that's very hard to do. Uh, we have 80 people here at the firm that are cranking on this all the time, fully loaded with, again, AI, data scientists, machines. This is not easy, but it's easy for me to remember the important points. The top 10 features in our macro model absolutely matter. And I have no idea how the Atlanta Fed is where they are in GDP, and I don't particularly care. I'm actually, like I said, gainfully employed, all these people at the Fed, the government pays for it, you're the people that are uh, signing off on that. Uh, but again, I, I just as soon as sign off on that for my own selfish reasons, because we want to fade that. Yeah, I actually know exactly where, why we're different from the Atlanta Fed on GDP. So. Their model is anchoring on the improvement in the trade balance has been a function of the reduction in Chinese imports, or imports from China, rather, as positive for GDP. Um, the way our model, our model sort of back tests and, and retrains itself every quarter based on what's driving GDP from a second derivative perspective. And imports, uh, which is actually the number six feature in the model currently, um, are actually slow pretty sharply, uh, down 344 basis points uh, quarter over quarter. And then our model actually, one, one thing that's actually very different from our, our models currently set up um, to interpret the change in the trade balance. Right now, the change in the trade balance is actually having a pretty outsized drag on our, our estimate relative yeah. to the Atlanta Fed, which is having a, a positive um, positive import. So the, the trade balance on a year-over-year -year rate of change perspective uh, is up for 1,483 basis points. So it went from you know 361, 3.61% year-over-year to up 18.44% year-over-year on a year-over-year -year rate of change basis. That, our model sees that as a negative input, just based on what the, the sort of trending correlation mm. between that and, and GDP are on a first difference basis. So, you know, that's, that's what's driving the big delta. But at the end of the day, we're not, we don't do this to compete with the Atlanta Fed. We do this to figure out what quad we're in mm -hmm. and what the appropriate asset allocation is going to be. Now, 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 if Joan Curtin was standing here, it'd be like, I don't know, I don't, I don't, I don't. You'd, you'd have interrupted you three times already. Totally. You know, <laughs> but, but again, he doesn't know. Right? I mean, right now, not to pick on CNBC, Bloomberg's not as bad, but like live now, Carlos Ghosn holds a Q&A session. I mean, like, what, what are you doing? Why are you wasting part of your day doing that? Like, if you want to be- 9.24, how the hell is that on TV? Yeah, it's just, it's what it is, yeah. right? It's what it is. The market's so, about to open. Yeah, we got it. We got it. You got to make <laughs> some decisions about your money. Carlitos or Carlos ain't going to help you. All right, so what, let's get on with the Q&A. Yeah, no, it's a disaster. All right, uh, great question here from Josh. Um, um, why are you still so bullish on energy when the conditional factoring back test suggests it's one of the worst performing sector styles in the quad three 
to quad three transition. Because the conditional factoring that is the signal. The signal is Again, bullish. don't just, I know it's a, appealing, particularly for you intellects. Uh, I'm, I have the lowest SAT score at Yale, so within the realm of intellects, I'm a very low, low, <laughs> not low energy, but definitely lowly ranked, you know, intellect. Um, but if you want to be totally intellectual, rules-based, model-based, and only look at the quads, and most importantly, conditional probability of the quads, all of which you wouldn't have had unless we gave them to you, and you still want to be intellectual, that's totally cool. Um, but on the other side of it, there's this thing called the signal. This is for the more rudimentary people like me, the traders, the people that trade, the people that um, have shorter term you know, actions in the market, you know, the, the people that have been demeaned, okay? So I'm that guy, Darius is the smart guy, and what I do is I combine the two things, all right? So again, I'm the meat, he's the sauce. Maybe one way to think about it. <laughs> um, the, so again, that's, 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 that's what it is. You can, the signal is as strong as it has been <laughs> in energy. And by the way, we're just coming to the, to, to the realization. The other big one that's driving the signal, don't forget, Josephine's on the switch. She's going to have this for you, buddy. You're going to get it, intellectual or not. The inverse correlation between uh, anything that is commodities, by the way, in the U.S. dollar. Okay, now the machine really likes that one. Because what the machine's doing is it's front-running the Fed. So are you feeling smarter now on why that is? as opposed to just anchoring on the one part of the question you did, which I appreciate, but I still wouldn't agree with, you can see that there's like a 77% inverse correlation on a 30-day basis between commodities and the dollar. So again, that's another, that's another thing that's driving my signal to a place that I'm gonna stay long and buy long, buy energy on every damn dip until I damn well please, because the signal isn't about being pleased intellectually or not. It's about the singular, uh, the singular setup of our, our actual decision-making process, which includes the quads, thanks for mentioning that, but don't disrespect the signal. The signal front runs the quads. Yeah, and I would want to add one quick thing to that final point. The conditional factoring back tests do not form the basis of your asset allocation. What forms the basis of your asset allocation is what quad you're in. No, no, what... stop there. Everybody wants one thing, though. And every time we give them a new thing, they want that one thing. They want that one thing. Just it's, one thing. Totally. But totally. Go ahead. There's only, there's only 11 quarterly observations in the quad three to quad sequence back test. So if you're forming your quad three back test on that, or your, your asset allocation on that, you don't have enough data set, that's it. You look at the broader range of all quad three iterations and what's happened over the course of market history and say, okay, if I'm in a quad three, this is what's likely to work and this is what's not likely to work. We show that on slide eight, just in the, in the deck. This is what's likely to work, this is what's not likely to work, and the conditional factoring back test, layer on, you can layer those on top and say, okay, well, if energy doesn't typically perform well in the quad three to quad three sequence, that might be some place where I think about, you know, sort of expanding options premium to maybe protect against downside in that particular exposure. But you want to be long energy in quad three. Yep. Okay, go to slide 75 as well. Okay, slide 75. And I'm going to do a little doodling for some of you. Because, again, I know, the alternative is watching Netflix if you're unemployed or Carlos going right now if you're working and have something on at work, okay? But we're gonna show you something that you can actually learn something from that's practical, okay? So sometimes you have to have somebody draw on data. Data can be boring, don't forget. Like Picasso said, it's not what you're looking at, it's what you see, right? See, I'm not as dumb as I look. I mean, it's, it's, there's some really cool one-liners out there, but look at this, okay? So this is, uh, again, related to the question. But again, the question did entirely ignore this, which is the ultimate. So this is called That's the ultimate conditional. This factor. is the ultimate conditional factor. Thank you, Darius. It's called cowbell. Okay. <laughs> now, if you don't know what that is, that that's this. Thing, right? So you go like that. Oh, stop it, Jim Cramer. You go back to the data. The cowbell. <laughs> see cowbell? When the Fed eases the expected value of mm, gold, mm, crude. See these? These are good. Oh shit! Why didn't the guy ask the question about tech? <laughs> Oh, damn. Anything growth. That, that's not green. All right? Energy's on the right so side that, of the chart. So when we're looking at this data, we're not ringing horns. And the cowbell's great. It was a gift from a client. Loved it. This is what we're talking about. The market is starting to discount that all of Wall Street is hoping for a bottom when the data continues to slow, i.e. the ninth feature in the model, factory orders, most recent representation of that data slowing. And as the economic data slows towards zero, Currently, again, if you look at our, uh, our current GDP Nowcast, guys, uh, slide 14 in the current macro deck, I believe, zero. I didn't just like say it feels like zero, it is zero, okay? So GDP is tracking at 0 0.3, what is that, 3.5 percent, Darius? Uh, the other 3.5. 3.5, Absolutely. precisely 0 0.35, and the Atlanta Fed's up at two something. As the Fed comes to realize that that's the economy they have, they're gonna have to go incrementally more dovish, devalue the dollar, and gold and oil are gonna go higher. Now, that, I didn't still say anything about Iran, okay? I've already bought oil 
you know, again, the conditional probability to buy oil started in October. This is called a phase transition. The phase transition of the dollar going from up to down. You can go back and audit our work. We went bullish on the dollar on, in April of 2018, got bearish in October of 2019, and similarly went bullish on commodities after being bearish across the same time period. It's a goddamn so, good call. So this is a pretty good call, right? I mean, but if all you do is stocks and turn this off and don't subscribe. If all you do is stay long the market, just why are you watching this? Yeah. Why would you even wake up at 9.30? I would wake up at 11. Because they're looking <laughs> for tips. They're yeah. looking for hints. Yeah. You know, some of you are like 80 years old, right? I mean, uh, neurologically, us men, we start to lose it at 71. So again, apologies not. But again, you, you, you've got to be a little frustrated, right? How many times have you lost half your money? You're still looking for tips? What are you actually looking for? You, got, you don't have that much time left. I mean, I, I may not either. Don't look for tips, look for process. Process, process, process. Tips, though. <laughs> tips is part of the process. We actually like tips at Quad 3 as part of the process. <laughs> oh, tips, T-I-P, yeah, yeah, beauty. Absolutely. Oh, by the way, we put that in, if you don't subscribe to the early look uh, note this morning, yeah. uh, long, T I, uh, long TIP, no, uh, yes. TIP only at the, at the loan of the range. Uh, TIP is tips, inflation protection, yes, long. Again, short converts as of yesterday. CWB is ETF for that. Awesome, all right, next question here from uh, Joe Cat. Uh, howdy. Has the complexion of volatility changed since the advent of the machine? Are there any meaningful differences in the aspects of volatility pre and post computerized trading? My assumption is no, uh, but he'd love to hear you speak on this. It's actually very not no. <laughs> no, no not no, no. Very not no. <laughs> now, so if you want to know about volatility, please read the best book, uh, according to me, uh, in terms of having an actual application to not only preserving your wealth, but allocating your wealth accordingly and risk managing your wealth daily. Um, that's the misbehavior of markets. So again, Mandelbrot goes all the way back, and this is the you know, really the forefather of fractal math, which uh, the, you know, the centrifuge of our model is built on, uh, really uh, goes through this. He did it with Big Blue and all of commodity prices. He's like, look at cotton prices. Da, 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 da. Volatility clusters, okay? There's a lot of Brownian motion, and then there's a cluster of volatility that's non-trending, then it trends. That's what volatility has always done and continues to do. If anything, the machine makes it do it faster in certain points where the clustering, again, the conditional factor and the clustering are the quads. The two most causal factors in all of what drives macro, and you don't have to take my word for it because you're not gonna believe me if you don't pay us, um, but if you wanna believe Ray Dalio, that's a better one. If you need to believe a billionaire, that's fine. I'm just little mucker who's not worth that much money. Um, it doesn't, it's not about that. It's about, his, your question is a very important question, and what, 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 what it is, is that the causal factors that ca cause a change, a regime change, or a phase transition in volatility are the rates of change in growth and inflation, okay? So that's where you're, you saw the cluster that you saw in oil, for example. Oil volatility was like 50 by 80. If you don't know what that is, it's OVX, oil volatility index. Um, and then all of a sudden it broke down through what is a trend signal of 38. Then it collapsed. And now it can go to 21, 22 vol on oil VIX. Um, so again, that's super bullish for oil volatility. It went from, again, episodic and non-trending vol to clustering vol to a breakdown in vol. And that's when the asset class caught a bid. It had nothing to do with Iran. Mm -hmm. yeah, and the one thing I'll say just to add, uh, on slide 11, we have the, the vol of all table. You know, the JP Morgan, this is last year, estimated that 90% of all U.S. equity trading is systematic. And some large chunk of that is on, you know, multi-manager platform shops. You know, we, you know who you are. Um, appreciate you guys tuning in. Um, you know, <laughs> anyway, the, the point is, is these guys all have to run some version of market neutral, which means they're constantly delta hedging their exposures into the close, into the open, just to stay market neutral because they can't trade the underlying cash positions because the market's illiquid. And so they're using options, you know, right now. They're using options to sort of, um, you know, reaffect their their dealt their gross and net exposures. And what you're seeing, you see all this activity take place in the sort of one month window, which is why we track that on, yep. on an applied um, volatility. I, I never, uh, you know, if I, I shouldn't say never, but I mean, in the last uh, five years, I started measuring and mapping that by virtue of what Darius just said. You know, if you're running on a uh, at a pod shop, which is also uh, critical to understand here, uh, which has to run literally neutral. I mean, you're constantly delta hedging within the one month window. Yeah, you, know, you can get fired if you're down for three days. Totally. Let's, let's be clear. That's, That's not fake news. Okay, so again, the one month really matters not only to the machine, but the behaviors that are embedded in what the machine is behaving on. Okay, so if you go to slide four, uh, what the real backs, back, backdrop on this on flows 
is quite uh, what our entire model is also built on, which is the change in the investment landscape. So when you go from U.S. equity funds under management uh, and what their percentage are in terms of active versus passive, uh, that is what it is. The machines, you know, while they might be, uh, again, you might call it a passive exposure, the machine absolutely rides passive instruments. So that's, that's, that's a big change. And again, we've changed alongside it. Many people have not. They're just picking stocks. You know, I mean, that's just, it's like so stupid. I couldn't say it any other way. I mean, there's this, it's this is this is really important stuff. And thank you for asking the question about volatility because that really gets to the to the heart of the matter after you acknowledge everything else that's already happened within the investment landscape. Mm-hmm. Cool. Let's get a couple more here. All right, Michael's asked it with gold running uh, hot and the COT um, commitment to traders report for commercials being so slanted to being short. Would you consider taking profits with most of the load of, in terms of the core position in gold and letting the rest run? Well, I mean, I, again, I have a core position in gold. Uh, Which I we've had since I'm not marketing, Q4 of 18. Like, like somebody would tell you, and I, I cited his book this morning, a lot of respect for him, he's my friend, Jim Rickards, that you should be always uh, allocated X percent of gold. No, I would not do that. Again, it's a difference of opinion. I will be long gold when it's in quad three and quad four, most specifically when real yields are falling, okay? And if we have quad two, where we have real growth accelerating, real growth accelerating, okay? This is the aftermath of what happens, okay? Uh, when gold collapses, effectively you have real yields breaking out to the upside. So in quad two, you don't have a, anything asset allocation to gold, you're shorted. Okay, so that's how we think about gold. Um, mm -hmm. There's no other way to think about it other than within the daily risk range. So at the top end of the range, you sell some, at the bottom of the range, you buy some, until we tell you that we're coming out of quad three or four, and our view is that real yields are starting to rise. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, next question here from Timo. What are the key data points behind your inflation accelerating call? Well, uh, it's, it's, uh, the crude is the biggest one. So if, I mean, <laughs> They're all accelerating. Yeah, all core, the things that are accelerating. Core goods, inflation is accelerating. Uh, core wages is a big one. Wages, inf co wages are accelerating. Core, uh, core services, uh, inflation is accelerating. Energy inflation is accelerating. Prices paid on the ISM and the, uh, the manufacturing and non-manufacturing accelerating. You know, Cleveland Fed has a median CPI index, which uh, tracks... Um, all the subcomponents of the CPI at the uh, disaggregated level, and then it amalgamates that. So whatever the median year-over-year -year rate of change is at 2.91 percent in November, that's in the 97th percentile of all the readings over the past 10 years. So there's clearly been this inflation upswell underneath the hood in terms of core services and core goods prices um, that obviously wasn't necessarily being reflected in the headline statistics over the past sort of six to nine months prior to the most recent upsurge that we call 97th for. percentile. Think about that. Again, if you're not mathematically oriented, you're not thinking about anything when I say that. But again, uh, again, just, just a little bit of a side joke. I know some of you, you really, really do need to think mathematically if you want to subscribe to this. And I always encourage people to, 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 to subscribe only if they have an open mind mathematically. If you want to think politically, you want to think emotionally, this is not, definitely not for you. Um, uh, and we'll beat you uh, pretty badly, I might add. So again, that's important. 97th percentile. I can't understate you know, how high that is in any historical measure. Yeah, absolutely. All right, last question here. Good process question to end on from Chris. It says, realizing that it's never just one thing, which we appreciate you acknowledging that, Chris. Uh, when you're GIP modeling your market signal or discordant, good word, do you tend to prefer one versus the other? Or, or is this where the experience of being a practitioner for 20 years helps influence which signal you tend to believe is more accurate? Again, I'm, I'm not, I, I'm, I have four children. I do not prefer one over the other. I mean, I do not prefer the quad over the signal. Uh, it's a singular decision-making process that includes all of the children in my family, all of the factors in the model, okay? I don't know if that's simple enough for you, but that's really the answer. You do, you, you do have to be a human being at the switch, okay? Mm -hmm. We did build the model. Some people are like, ah, no, we could just make it all a machine. Okay, well, that's a drone. Um, I'm not a drone. And when you get into, and again, and maybe one, another way for those of you uh, more advanced power users of the process, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll quite appreciate this part of it. The OODA loop, okay? The OODA loop from John Boyd. You know, this is, this is literally and essentially what he's trying to tell everyone, which is when you're in the heat of the moment of combat, we're talking about dogfighting. You know, this is, this is one of the most uh, important U.S. military strategists of all time. When you're in that moment, it's that incremental decision you make when the other person's about to make their mistake. That's what matters, okay? You'd need a human in the cockpit, okay? That's me. You know, unfortunately, you're stuck with me until I pass away or whatever, whatever happens to me. Um, but again, you have to be you, too. And I think we've given you plenty of tools to be the best pilot that you can be. Because, again, the tools are, are, are giving you basically a rules-based process uh, that you can say, okay, look, here's my framework. 
Here's my process. Here's why I'm making these decisions. And I'm going to rinse and repeat that, understanding that when you make decisions, the outcomes aren't always going to be positive, right? Don't focus so much on the outcome. Focus on what you're doing, OK? The outcome can be right for the wrong reasons. That's why I say that. The outcome can be right for the right reasons. So it's what you're doing that really matters within that OODA loop or whatever your decision-making process is. And I think so many people focus on the outcome. Whoa, whoa, whoa look at stocks. You're the date. Well, that's, that's, that's asinine, right? It's enough to like, really make some people upset, but it's an asinine comment to say what, how good stocks were year-to-date without saying how they crashed, crashed year to date in the day in the year to date prior. Crashed in the quarter prior. That gave birth to the to to, to that year to date gain. So we don't want to be doing that. We don't want to be lost in that type of a discussion. You know, God willing, for as long as we can, we can improve our process. We can improve our process. We can do a lot of doing and focus on wow. Am I, is my decision making process solid? Is it repeatable? Am I right for the right reasons? Am I right for being lucky? And when I'm wrong, by the way, I can be wrong because the market got lucky or the president of the United States just tweeted to buy stocks. I mean, there's a lot of different reasons that people can win, um, but the process isn't always one of them. Yeah, can you, can we, let's wrap this up because Carl's going still on TV. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> All right, just joking, guys. <laughs> we appreciate you guys tuning in. Thank you for joining us. We'll catch you back here tomorrow, same time. Have a great day out there.